Professor William Calvo Quiroz, how are you today? Doing great. How about you? I'm doing well. I'm excited to talk to you today. So you have an undergraduate degree, two masters, two doctoral degrees. You're writing your first book. What haven't you done? I don't know. I see. Mm, what I have not done. I have not been a movie star. I'm not in commercial for hair. I don't know. I don't do those things. And I, I'm a professor at the University of Michigan in the Department of American Culture in the program of Latino Studies. I do a class on Latina feminist theory for those who are doing research in Latino studies. I do a class on uh, Latino uh, art and aesthetics in the barrio. Uh, I do a class on monsters where we study the Chupacabras and the Llorona. And then we also teach a class on cars because we're in Detroit and cars have been an important component, not just for the Latino community, but the city and the states overall and the United States. So that's what a little bit I do. You, you touch on a lot of different topics, which is, which is truly incredible. It's inspiring. You truly represent the possibility of being able to study a wide variety of areas, not conforming to just one specialty. So that's, that's very admirable. You mentioned the word barriology in your studies of cars, what, what drew you to this study? When you look at me, you may have the impression that it's a little schizophrenic, like from cars to monsters, to saints, to murals, to queer studies. Now, from the outside, it looked that way. But for me, it had totally sense in the sense that we are talking about one unified subject, you know, the Latino life experience in the United States. And because we're talking about a community, the community had multiple expressions of their life. So in many ways, and, and it's called Latino studies, or what we call cultural studies. So therefore, all these expressions of the culture of that community were manifesting in many different ways. We study that, you know, uh, but mostly is the understanding of how those knowledges of the community had transferred into the objects or the practices that we have. So when we talk about barriology, is that logos of the barrio, the knowledges of the barrio, and it's a way to recognize the value of our points of reference, of our experiences, of what we do. So in the way that murals are not just aesthetic objects, or how do we customize our cars, they also help us to move forward and imagine a world with different. So they all look at different things, but they were all interconnected for this kind of an invisible line who is this kind of hope of this community to build a work with better and an expert of the barrios. Now, of course, barrios are just one of the many spaces occupied by Latinos. So in many ways, the barrio is not necessarily only a place, but it's the person itself. So we carry the barrio with us. So when you are a student at the University of Michigan, because of your aesthetics, the way that we talk, the food that we like, the music, so we carry with us a little bit of the barrio. You know, so the barrio is us itself. The same thing that Gloria Saldua had talked about, you know, that U.S.-Mexico border is not just the line that divides Mexico to the United States. It is the person. So immigrants carry within the border, you know, because if you go to a Home Depot parking lot in Detroit, but well, Detroit is a border town, but let's say that you go to Chicago or to Kansas, that place, the parking lot of Home Depot became the border because it's the place where people encounter the other. You know, so the border may be, of course, the line, but it may be language proficiency, access to service, the church itself. So the border is not just a central line, it's, it's carried by people in different places. It may be the school, or it may be the radio station, including, for example, the beauty pages. The border is in different places because of a language. For example, when I speak, people clearly can see my accent. So that's a marker of my, of my immigrant experience. But it may be, how do we look? What do we eat? Et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. And one of the things that you mentioned was kind of the aesthetics of the barrios. So I'm not sure how and if this is able to connect with your work and epistemetic genealogy of Jota, Joto, aesthetic traditions. But mm -hmm. would you be able to share a little bit more about yeah. this research? So. Well, I'm a gay man, I'm an immigrant, and I do research in the community, but also one of the constituencies is reflected by the LGBTQ community. So as a student, when I was doing my period in Chicano studies, there was this question, 
where do we locate spaces of emancipation for us queer people in the barrio? You know, and, and I think what is interesting for me is this kind of desire to build a world who is different. Imagine a place where differences are recognized. And Hoto is an interesting term because Hoto is a negative, you know, pejorative, very heavy term, you know, who is used against queer people in, in Mexico. But we decide just as the same way that queer had been reappropriated to give a different meaning. So the same thing happened for with the word Hoto. So a few years ago, maybe over a decade or more, we started to call Hoteria study to define these spaces to study queer experience within the Latino community. Very much specific about the queer Chicano experience, okay? But the idea is to create space who are unique for us. One of the things that I say is that there's many technologies or ways of how we can try to build that world that is different. You know, so when you go to a drag queen show, for example, it's not just the fantasy of the space, it's also the, how the fantasy were to build a space who is unique on yours, who are not one place or the other. Uh, but I think one of the most important thing, and this is not just queer studies, but it's in general, is this desire of imagining a world who is different is what we call this kind of epistemologies or this kind of ways of thinking about, because you need to imagine a world who is different before you can enact it, you know? So if you cannot imagine, that's why science fiction and speculative fiction is so important because it helps us to think the world can be different, even if I don't know how it is. Now, in order to build a fantasy world, you need to understand very well the real world. And that's why we say right. that the fantasy world is intimately connected with the real, you know, because to imagine how it's going to look different, you need to have an experience. So our experiences of oppression, discrimination, define how do we envision a world with different. This world that queers and people who are different and people of color are imagining is one that assumes that everybody is going to look the same or that we are going to be the same. It's a world where differences are used and recognized as a value of each other. So it's not like a, I want a person who is from a different ethnic group to look Latino or act Latino. No, I want them to be fully the culture and the community and I want mine to be fully. In the way that the difference is this, in a system of exploitation, people or the system use differences to validate why somebody get paid less than others. So some people call it exploitative capitalism or greed. So in that one, you use that somebody have a different skin color or different status or different gender or sexual orientation to justify what they get paid less than somebody else. The society that we want is one where those differences remain in the same, that people are still different to each other, but you don't use it against them. You value this, you, you try to enhance them. So the person is queer or the person is straight, we recognize those different because we want the person to be the best they can, but we don't use those different to justify discrimination. Actually, we want value each other culture in the way that what I have can be given to the other person and the other person can give me something. So the aesthetics of this kind of hotelier stereo, this queer space is imagine a world who is different when people's differences are used as a fuel to love and care for each other. Absolutely. So then these kinds of differences that you described, not necessarily in your response, but definitely in your research, I, I envisioned a camp kind of look when you when you described the aesthetics of truly... Camp, camp is fantastic. Camp is fantastic because it's disruptive. You know, there is a lot of work done in, in camp. Uh, now, a few things. Camp is the term that we normally use in cultural studies at large. In Latino and Chicano studies, they may use other terms like rasguache to talk about this kind of excessive, a cursi, extravagante, loud, you know, aesthetic of the individual. Now, a few things to need to understand. One, camp is political because it creates this rupture in the norms of how people assume how people should wear or how they should talk. So in that sense, for many communities of color, camp have been allowed them to carve a space who are, you know, against the norms, where they say, I exist in my own differences. But at the same time, we need to understand that in many ways, all Latinos are camp, not because you are loud and have a lot of colors, but because when we speak, because my accent is not normative, 
I became disruptive. Because people say like, oh, I don't understand what you say. Or can you speak a little bit clear? Or why you cannot speak is English, you know? Now, even though I'm speaking English, but the accent, you know, they get stuck in that one. So my accent became camp in many ways because it's disruptive. But it's also our bodies. We don't necessarily have that skinny little body the media portray us to have, you know? Uh, so our bodies become disruptive. You see, for example, how this representation of Latina always as hypersexual, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in one way, we need to recognize the toxic abscess of patriarchy, you know, who objectify the individual. But at the same time, we recognize that it's almost like you cannot escape that notion because just by who we are, we always are going to be presented as an outsider. So what can produce is a notion like a if you cannot recognize me as different or equal in my difference, so I'm going to emphasize my difference in the way that you cannot escape. So, for example, when I do research on lowriders, it was very interesting for me that some of those cars are in very bright colors. And, and they were saying to me, listen, you cannot escape if your car is pink. If you drive a pink car in, in, the, in the street, people will look at you. So, what is interesting here is that they say, okay, I know that you are looking at me already because I'm brown. The police mm-hmm. are, are looking at me as an object, you know, that I need to be incarcerated, that I need to be controlled, that I need to be put aside. So I mm-hmm. know that I'm a victim of that kind of gaze, or the police or the state. What I'm going to do in this camp technique is that I'm going to amplify so much the visual noise. I'm going to make my car pink and loud with flowers and symbols and extensions in the way that I now have the power over you because you cannot escape looking at me. I mean, mm-hmm. I know you're looking, but now I control that. So that's the power of camp. And what is interesting is that they say to me, some of the low writers, like, listen, because now I know that they're looking at me, but they also know that they're not the only one looking, not just the police, but everybody in the street. So if you try to do something to me, you know that there is an audience looking. So they utilize the gays to create a community of gazers who protect them in some way. So camp is not just aesthetical, it's also political. That's why, for example, the world of our faculty who do research in, in dry queens is so interesting because they bring into the forward, like a, what is camp do to the politics of emancipation? You know. When the individual became this other persona, this other persona is capable to enact a world who is different. So uh, thinking, for example, about the world of Larry LaFontaine, you know, and all this kind of uh, trans locus, that locura became a space of emancipation and healing. I mean, I remember reading a piece by a professor from Argentina. He said, love is a scandal. It's a scandal. Because love proposed you to do things who are completely different of what the system of exploitation proposed. In that sense, he said, I am a person who produced a scandal. I am a scandal because we are saying that we don't need to be only defined by this system of exploitation, that we can imagine a world when Latinos can be fully flourished as a community. So that's a scandal because the system cannot imagine that. They can only imagine us as a greaser, uh, a gardener, a maid, etc. Now, they're all honest and important jobs. My mom worked for me for many years cleaning bathrooms and hotels. But what I'm trying to say is that they cannot imagine us outside those things. And now we say, my present is an scandal because my existence created a disruption. So that's how camp is so scandaloso. So that's what I say, people, embrace your scandal. Just be scandaloso. <laughs> Just be proud of who you are. Yeah, we have to take up our space when we walk into yeah. these rooms. Yeah. So you mentioned that these spaces in, in the research that you did are spaces where difference is embraced fully. And I want to quote this part directly mm-hmm. because it's very powerful. The spaces allow us to lower our guard, relax, and recover from the exhausting work of trying to survive in a world that has denied our existence or wants us dead. Where do these spaces exist for you and have you found any on campus? You know, it's, it's a beautiful question because I feel that finding those spaces, it requires two things. Sometimes you need to build them yourself. Therefore, they need to be very intentional. You meet with other people to create those. As an undergraduate, for me, 
the Latino groups, including the fraternities, where, you know, I was in a Latino fraternity. So it was good to be around other people that we can understand each other. We don't need to spend energy explaining things, you know, like, a, mm-hmm. yes, I know I call my mom every day. That's how it is because I need <laughs> yes. to call my mom, you know, and then yes. it's not thinking, oh my God, you are, you know, codependent and things like that. It's just, that's how my mothers, Latino mothers are, you need to call them. So, uh, call your mom. No, but what <laughs> I'm trying to say is like, uh, once of those spaces, you may find it in your family sometimes, but that is not always because at least for some queer constituencies, the family may have been actually a space of oppression. So they don't feel the family is the place. It's true. There is a lot of homophobia, but there is a more love than anything else. When my mom decided to embrace me and love me beyond what she understood, what it that means, you know, she made a revolutionary act. She said, I choose love over what the church say, what the state say, what my reasons say, whatever I have been taught. And that moment transformed my family and everything. Because by the time that my sister come to age, it was easy to talk about sexual health and that important for their health. And then when my cousins, one of them came out, it was easy to talk about in the family. So I found out that the act of love have scattered all this other transformation. So I would say those spaces exist where love is located. So you may find it in your sorority when there are campus groups. For example, La Casa. La Casa is an organization at the University of Michigan where I'm located. It can be one of those spaces where love and care define the politics and the way that they organize. So doing activism to have more diverse body of faculty or be sure that the students go to grad school, etc., is move for that desire of society who is different. So for me, sometimes faculty meetings became these spaces of healing. Some people will find it in churches or in different religious communities who represent the Latino community and their particular spirituality. So what I'm trying to say is that you may find those spaces in the most unexpected places. And we, because we have been deprived for many of those, when you find it, use it, reproduce it, spend time. So when you go to those undergraduate groups, do not think that it's just socialization, you know, or it's just having fun. What you're doing, actually, is like, a, you know, when you go into the stairs, you start walking the stairs, and you go right. some stairs, and there is a space, there's a little plateau for you to rest. Yeah. Why? Because we understand that you cannot keep walking and walking. You need to rest. <laughs> those rest right. spaces. So think about all those spaces as places of rest. You need to spend time there. You need to come there. And if you don't have it, create it. Be intentional. So in that sense, I would say I have been very lucky to find people around me who are loving and caring, who have helped me to find those spaces and nurture those spaces. For example, Copluma, who is the community for faculty and staff at the University of Michigan. And of course, art. The other day I was driving and somebody said, art as the cure. And I agree. Yes. So now you feel like you can truly express yourself in the way that you want to. I mean, I need to say that I'm very lucky in that sense. I grew up in a nation where for a long time I thought that I will never get old because I will die from AIDS, you know, or I will get beat up. So when my mom made the decision as a single mother to migrate to the United States without documentation, at risk on her own health and everything, she created a space for me to exist. Now, academia is having that space for me, but for different people are different. The important thing is never to compare each other and also recognize the privilege that we have. So I'm very much aware of the privilege that it means to be a faculty and the responsibilities of be a faculty of color and queer at the University of Michigan. A lot of people think the problem is power. Power is not necessarily the problem. The problem is how do we use power and how power is used against people. For me, I very much recognize the power that I have as a faculty, as somebody who writes, as somebody who can travel, and somebody who writes about other people. So I need to be almost walking a sacred space when I write because I need to be aware that whatever I put in words may have an impact in the quality of other people. And I need to be sure that I don't take it for granted or that I'm careless on how that I use the word. One of the big things that we need to do is to create not just a different society, but a different academia 
when we learn how to give it back to each other, that we question how do we do mentoring for the individual? How do we recognize the reality? So in this time, for me, the big question is how I help academia to become a place where the other can become the best they can. So how that I can do better use of the resources that I have. So the money that we have for our research, you don't use it just like that. You use it knowing that it's sacred money because it comes from for tax prayers. So you are responsible for that one. You want to be sure that you're doing well. Kind of a transition into your research about saints and monsters, <laughs> specifically the borderland of the U.S.-Mexico border, the physical border. How did you come across your dissertation topic for monsters of late stage capitalism along mm-hmm. the U.S.-Mexico border? So remember, I first did a dissertation on low riders. So with that research, it was very interesting because it was in the Department of Industrial Design. Um, the research was all about why do people do customizations for their cars? You know, so that was important for me. But more important was how do people use those cars to tell their stories? And from there, it just became more natural to start thinking about, I remember the first monster that I studied was the chupacabras because I grew up during the time where the chupacabra was everywhere. And we were scared of going outside at night because the chupacabra was outside. Of course, we didn't know if parents right. were using that one to keep us inside at night. Exactly. But, <laughs> you know, but I was very interested in how different people were attaching different meanings to, to this monster. You know, so in one place, the chupacabra was an anti-American sentiment in Puerto Rico, for example, in the context of the, the relationship of coloniality that they have with the United States. But later on in Mexico, the chupacabra was used to express feelings against NAFTA and the impact of NAFTA and the anti-government as well. But then in the United States, some people would use the chupacabras to talk about Latinos and how we were uneducated and we didn't understand what happened to the world or how we were like chupacabras because we were coming and eating resources and taking away from the states. So I was very interested in how the same entity that we don't even know if it exists, it will mean different people from one who is against the state to another one who is pro the state. The same thing, opposite. So that's how I begin to do research. Now, at that moment, my dissertation was very much about monsters and the imaginary because I was interested in how people tell these stories about oppression through the myth and legend that they create. We think about all those films about the omen or the exorcist. It's really a reaction mm-hmm. to the women liberation movement. You know, mm. uh, because all these monsters will come from women who were independent, who live in the city, who have a career. So and the idea was that these women will have children who destroy society. So we find out that by studying monsters, we can study society. And sometimes with my students, I found that it was easy for them to talk about racism and homophobia and sexism because they were not talking about that. They were talking about monsters. So when we say, OK, OK, let's talk about zombies. And they will say, well, zombies are this and this and this. And then later on, by later, say, okay, let's see. The zombies mean that it's an urban phenomenon. That because of the film, you cannot trust the government because the government knew and never did anything. Therefore, you need to have guns in the house and you need to promote militia groups. Oh, and then, you know, little by little, we start to talk about the present. But we were talking about zombies. And we're like, hey, look at these pictures of zombies and look at this fishing of the immigrant caravan. Oh, and then we start to unpack how zombies have become particularly popular in the last decade because it helped America or the world in general to deal with anxieties of this massive migration that we're experiencing around the world. Oh, and it justifies to have guns. Oh, it justifies to this and this. You know, the middleman, what is the middleman? It's exactly the same group that you have, a zombie group. So my dissertation at that point was a way to talk about the monster of exploitation and greed. So I always say in my classes, if the devil exists, it's not a guy in red with a tail and horn. It really looks like an octopus with many different faces. So sexism, homophobia, racism, anti-immigrant, anti-women, right? They all face of the same monster, okay? Over time, after I moved to the University of Michigan, and thanks to the help of my own colleagues, we started seeing that the book was a little schizophrenic, you know? And you can tell because of my multiple interests. We decided that it was better to focus in just one element, in this case, saints. So my current book uh, that is coming in August 
uh, is called Undocumented Saints, the Politics of Migrating Devotion, is focusing on five different saints, devotions who have emerged in Mexico and have migrated into the United States. So we basically talk about uh, all the politics of those devotions, you know? So they're all interconnected to my previous work because it's about how religion influence people migration and how migration may influence their religion experience. They're very tight. It's like a riddle, uh, but then we start to figure out that it was way more complex. Did you did you hear these stories about saints? You mentioned hearing about the chupacabra. Did, did you hear <laughs> other ones about monsters as well, well? Okay, so I need to confess a few things here. So I grew up in a Catholic family. Now, my family was very unique because my dad was a socialist atheist. And my mom come from a different family where we had nuns and priests. So I grew up with those stories, I would say, to the point that at one moment in my life, ding, 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 this is the big secret, I want to be a priest. So I wow. moved to a um, religious community outside Florence, Italy, and I lived there for a few years with the intention to become a priest. Uh, of course, it didn't work out, as you can tell. <laughs> but I think I moved to the most close thing that we have to a religious community, that is academia. Because we have robes, you know, that we wear for the ceremonies. We speak weird languages and key terms. And we have martyrs <laughs> in academia and, and saints. You know, Gloria and Saldo is like a saint. You know, right, people right. like their books and things. So, um, and we have passages, you know, like um, mm-hmm. tenure. Tenure is like uh, becoming a priest. The community embraced you permanently Mm -hmm. about our community. You know, I mean, the University of Michigan, the first president was a priest, a Catholic priest, you know, and we don't even think about it because we define ourselves as a secular universe. So Mm -hmm. religion was a very important component of my life. There is probably two central events that spark my interest in this project, political, both of them. Once I was in this seminary studying church history, and there was this sociologist, Vera Araujo from Brazil, and she at one moment said to us, listen, you can tell the story of the church by the different saints that came to exist in history. So you can go from San Benedictine to San Francis to San Loyola and blah, 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 blah. And they all bring a particular element that was needed or missing in the church. So there's, and I'm like, oh, wow. So I can tell the story of the church, not just by the documents of the church, but by the life of people. And that was very important for me. And the second one, <clears throat> I was in Phoenix, Arizona during 1070. I believe that it was maybe in 2010. I don't remember. 1070. Um, mm-hmm. It was a law that punished individuals who were helping other people without documentation. The law at that point was the most uh, outrageous, you know, anti-immigrant mm-hmm. law that we have uh, because it's not punished only the individual without documentation, but also those around them. So for example, if I have an apartment complex and some of the people staying in my apartment are without documentation, I will be charged, you know, with a misdemeanor because I was providing housing for them. If I'm a taxi driver who will provide a ride, I can be persecuted as if I was a coyote, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the law was very simple. Say, if somebody look as undocumented, then we're like, what do you mean look? How do you know when somebody yeah. has documentation? And they will say, well, look at the shoes, look at the clothes. I'm like, stupid, that's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. But it was really a law who was based on a, on a system of creating a network of terror around the right. individual. I was remember living in Phoenix, and during that time, Joe Apayo was the sheriff of Maricopa. So I remember, for example, in Black Friday, when everybody got to the mall to buy, Apayo went to the Latino malls, or malls where most of the people were in Latino barrios, and round the mall. So when people trying to escape, leave the place, they were surrounded by the police. You know, and the people wait and wait until a moment where the people in, in the mall said, you need to, we need to close, you need to leave. And the police was waiting for them outside. That's they terrible. were a moment, it's terrible. So I remember that in that context of terror, there was an event that happened in a church close to my mom because people were so terrified of losing their children and the children were taken away from them and put into a foster care and they will be lost. Uh, one way was for people to give consent of custody for somebody else in your family. So that's why a little sister of 12, 15 year old, 18 year old 
suddenly may became the poster of their own little brothers and sister if the mom or dad were the porter or a cousin, one neighbor or something. So I remember there was an event to help people file those papers and do all the documentation. And after the event, uh, who was in a Catholic church because it was a big hole and the idea was the church were protected against the police. As I was leaving, there was an image of a saint there and people were praying. I said to my mom, who is that saint? They said, oh, that's Toribio Romo. Is that saying for people without documentation? So I like, oh, so that's why I say that this project came from a political stand. You know, how the people are using religious to deal with the horror of the everyday life that they experience. This is not about if I believe or not believe in them, it's about what is important for the individual. So therefore, I'm not judging and I make assumptions, moral assumptions. I think how the people may utilize religion to survive. So uh, this book project look at five different saints. Uh, the first one is Jesus Malverde, who is very popular because people associate with the narco or narco capitalism, how I call it in my book, from Sinaloa. The second uh, chapter is about Olga Camacho, an eight-year-old girl who was kidnapped and killed in Tijuana in the late 1980s. And the main suspect, a soldier, uh, who is killed by the Leo Fuga, become the mm -hmm. same, not her. So my, like, how is possible the guy who is the main suspect in the killing of this, of this girl is the one who became the same for the community? So this is a chapter mm -hmm. when I analyze uh, the construction of violence against women, especially the femicides allowed the board. The third one is uh, Toribio Romo. Remember, it's the first one that I encountered, and however, one of the last ones that I did research. And the last one is La Santa Muerte, who is a very controversial devotion. So that's a little bit of my book. Yes, I'm so excited to read the book. I've been excited since I heard you speak for the first time in my class with the professor you mentioned earlier, Professor Larry uh -huh. LaFontaine Stokes. Yeah. Uh, it was I was so excited and mm -hmm. I'm excited for when it gets to come out finally. Yeah. So you, yeah. you teach these stories of saints, you write about them, you connect them to other facets of the Latinx community in the U.S. and as you mentioned abroad. How can students take what they've learned from your class about the Latinx community and then apply it to their everyday lives? Hmm. That's a very, that's a central question because that's a question that it should be for everybody. How do we mm -hmm. help people to uh, translate the information that they have for people to understand that their life and their experiences matter, okay? So uh, especially for Latinos, we, we do not have Latino classes in a high school or elementary school. We hear mm -hmm. about the Tri Guadalupe Hidalgo as one day Texas independent itself and the evil Mexicans <laughs> and we took the land away from them. You know, and we were very smart and we win the war. You know, and there is no, <laughs> no discussion about the impact that they have in this yeah. community, how the treaty never was put in place. So I think one of the first things that I want everybody to understand is the Latino studies it's American studies in the sense mm -hmm. that we are part of the American experience as Asian American, Native American, Arab American, Pacific Islander, because America mm -hmm. is really a collective project based on diversity, where multiple constituents coexist simultaneously. We have the possibility to give to the world how society can be in this kind of pluralistic way of thinking. So Latinos do not need to justify their existence because we are part of American history. I mean, mm -hmm. California, Texas, New Mexico, you know, Nevada, Florida, they were it's part of the Latin experience, not just by the number, but then also for the history. So I want mm -hmm. people to remember that your life as a Latino matters and that we have a very rich culture. A lot of time there is all this lack of information about what we do as, as there were some kind of deficiency in us, but there is not. Our culture are complete. They have all the elements for success. We have beautiful, beautiful writers and poems and music in our community. Of course, you should study Latin studies because you should be proud of the community. So for me, the work that I do in the Latino community, it is part of a larger project of health society, creating a united world, a world with more justice, where love and care is the basis. 
we've reached our final question. So if you could go back in time to when you were in high school or during your undergrad experience, what piece of advice would you give yourself? Use some block. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Use some block all the time. Drink more water. <laughs> Do not be yes. late doing exercise. Uh, what else? Eat more fiber. Eat more vegetables. <laughs> those those uh, are all valid. You know, but, but they, I just sound like my doctor. You know, I say to my doctor, <laughs> after all this year, you're still saying the same thing that you tell me a long time ago. No, but sunblock. Seriously, use sunblock. Especially with global warming. You need to use sunblock. Yeah. Um, um, no, but let's see what I can say to people. Few things. At the educational level, take as many different classes as possible. Do not worry too much about the grades. I mean, grades are important because, you know, people use it for go to grad school and things like that. But at one moment, you should be interested in learning. Learning is the most important thing. Grades are not. So if you take a class for the learning, you will find out that you will get, for the most part, a good grade. You know, you just follow that, that energy of the class. Uh, if you are an undergrad, go to office hours. Go to office hours because you want the faculty to know you. And if something happens, they are more likely to help you if they know who you are. So go to office hours. If you don't understand something, let them know. We get paid to help you. You're not a burden. You know, for many Latinos, we come from a family. We are the first generation going to college. We don't know how to do it. So don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, and the help may come, of course, in Latino faculty, but sometimes allies who may look very different to the people that you may think about it. But if I can say something for me, fall in love with whatever you're doing. Just fall in love. Just do something that fall in love. Now, one of the word advice that I heard is be yourself. Come on, don't be yourself. Because, you know, the important thing is that be yourself. Make the assumption that you are done as a project. We are not done as a, as a person and it's still in the making. My identity is transformed. Things that were very important for me when I was in my 20s became totally irrelevant when I got into my 40s. So don't think that you are completely dull. If you're in your 20s, you are just a 20-year-old person and you will have a problem so a 20-year-old person and you will suffer as a 20-year-old person and there will be a different time when you will have a different pains and a different joys. So what I'm trying to say is like, a, don't be yourself. Be the best self that you can be at that moment with the information that you have. Thank you so much. Professor Carlos Quiroz, I appreciate it so much. I'm excited to make more escándalos in my life, and I yes. hope others are inspired to do so too. 